The job of the blender is to combine these elements in such a way as to produce an overall flavor. A wider repertoire of different beverages than ever before. I think one of the most interesting breweries and certainly one of the most interesting origin stories for a brewery in Australia. Single malts, blends, grain whiskies, bourbons and more. If you want their style to be sold around the world, then unfortunately you're going to have to make a compromise. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson. And this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Renowned winemaker Samantha Conyu launched her own label Stargazer Wines in 2013 by purchasing a parcel of grapes on her credit card. The bootstrapped operation has since grown into one of Tasmania's most exciting boutique wineries. In 2013, Sam purchased a small Riesling and Pinot Noir vineyard in the Coal River Valley that she has supplemented by planting new clones of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, along with some more Riesling and Gamay soon to come. In this episode of Drinks Adventures, Sam shares her somewhat unusual path into winemaking that began with a student job in a Christchurch wine bar. Seizing an opportunity to work her first vintage in Oregon, USA, Sam was hooked immediately. Her wine career since has included additional overseas vintages in Italy and Spain, and back in Australia, lengthy stints in McLaren Vale and the Hunter Valley. A highly respected wine judge who has been a panel chair at many regional and capital city wine shows, Sam was appointed chair of judges at the Sydney Royal Wine Show in 2014. She was the first female and the youngest judge to achieve that position, but it hasn't all been smooth sailing. In fact, Sam says her decision to launch Stargazer was due in part to the blatant sexism she's dealt with throughout her career. First up though, Sam recounts how she transitioned from law student to winemaker. Well, I pretty much decided after my, I think my first, first or second year of law that I was never going to practice law in the traditional sense. Ironically, that choice was based on the fact that I saw it as being too male dominated, which is, yeah, pretty funny in terms of where I've ended up. But um, we can talk about it a little bit more about that later on. But still, I still finished doing my law degree. I did a double degree in law and a BA in political science and English literature. What drove you to pursue those qualifications in the first place? I'm being all fuddy-duddy here, but it was a different time back then in terms <laughs> of, you know, I went to a single-sex school in New Zealand. We weren't encouraged, to my mind at least, to pursue STEM subjects at all. We didn't even know what STEM was back then. Um, so, you know, we were, and I was drawn to do, to the humanities anyway, to history and um, I did history and classics and, you know, French and English all through school. Um, didn't see myself as being particularly well equipped in terms of the science or the math side of it um, and still don't to a certain extent. I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but that was the the, the time of LA Law. And, you Actually, know, my parents those, used to watch that. <laughs> you know, see, there you go, I'm dating yeah. myself. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, like it was seen as pretty glamorous to be a lawyer at that point in time. It was before yeah. everyone started c- cracking up with the, coming out with all the um, lawyer jokes, I suppose. Um, so it was seen as a, a worthwhile profession. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm still really glad that I did a law degree. It's come in very helpful in a lot of situations and particularly obviously now with having my own small business. Um, it's come in pretty useful. So, but, you know, I guess like most uni students at that point and probably still now, you know, I had to support myself um, and I did that by working in restaurants. Fortunately for me, I ended up working at a fabulous wine bar in Christchurch in the Art Centre in Christchurch, which was pretty groundbreaking at that point in time. I mean, this is the early 90s and all of the wines on the wine list were available by the glass. And it was really when the New Zealand wine industry from a boutique sense was starting to take off. So we didn't have any of the main, you know, that, that wasn't Montana or Corbins or anything like that. We had a lot of the, the fabulous, you know, boutiques, producers, micro-producers 
and from New Zealand and, um, you know, a few Aussie wines as well. And I, we got to fortunately drink them and try them. So, yeah, that's how I came to it, how, how I came to, to wine was from that side of it, from having a love for wine and loving the environment, I guess, more holistically in terms of the whole hospitality side of it, serving wine with food, um, the environment of people sitting around a table and sharing a bottle of wine. And there was a chance meeting that led to you doing your first vintage over in Oregon. Yeah, so that's when I started doing postgrad at Lincoln University in, in enology and, and viticulture, but I was still working at the same wine bar and the art centre. And one day a couple from Oregon came in um, and we started talking. They discovered that I was studying when it turned out that they owned Elk Cove and um, Joe and Pat Campbell, they were the owners of Elk Cove and in Oregon, and they offered me a vintage job on the spot. So that was my first vintage was in Oregon, which was amazing. That first vintage, obviously, it got under your skin and, and you didn't go running in the other direction. No, well, I always say to people, you know, the first vintage, it's a, a make or break scenario. And right from the word go, I just loved it. I mean, I was in a magical part of the world. I don't know if you've got been to Oregon, but that whole northwest corner, Pacific northwest corner of the States and, and up through Canada as well. It's just a beautiful part of the world, um, an amazing place in terms of the wine making and wine growing community there and obviously passionate about Pinot. And the Campbells were incredibly hospitable and welcoming. Um, and so, you know, I was part of the family as well. But right from the minute of having, you know, picked up my first wine hose, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I was very, you know, very lucky in that regard in, in terms of how it all worked out. Obviously now with Stargazer, your, you know, Pinot Noir is, is one of your lead grapes. Was that time in Oregon sort of influential in, in, in getting you interested in that grape? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, from the sense of, because I spent a huge amount of time in the vineyard when I was there as well, and I subsequently did another vintage in Oregon, Oregon in 2001 at Beaufrey and um, that the fastidiousness that's required with Pinot from the vineyard through to the winery is perfectly in sync in terms of my personality and my approach to winemaking and my attention to detail and anal attentiveness so there's a synchronicity there I suppose between a, that variety um, and what I'm like as a winemaker so it was I, you know it was always going to be thus I suppose in terms of how it's worked out with me ending up in Tasmania making Pinot so yeah there was just a few other life and career experiences along the way. You had a really long stint at Wirrawirra what happened between Elk Cove and, and finding the job in McLaren Vale? So after Elk Cove, I did a vintage in Western Australia at Cape Mentel, which was great fun. And after that, I was in Sicily, on the western coast of Sicily, doing the whole fly and winemaker thing there for a stint. And then after that was vintage at Brokenwood. So that was 99. Yeah, really lucky to work with some amazing winemakers there and just a great crew. I mean, Brokenwood's renowned for its team environment and that you know that continues very much to this day and that's how I ended up getting the job at, at Wurra because Broken Wood then as it still does sources quite a bit of fruit from McLaren Vale and that in the day back in the day that used to be processed through Wurra Wurra and Ian Riggs knew that they were looking for an assistant winemaker so basically applied for the job for me pretty much and it all worked out and I started there at the end of September 99. You must have enjoyed your time there because uh, because from memory it was a decade that you spent there. Yeah, that's right. I was really lucky in terms of the time that I landed there because it was the middle of when the wine industry was going nuts from an export sense and where it was a big part of that as was, you know, most, as were most wineries in South Australia and it was also that, that whole, you know, Robert Parker Jr., big US scores, you know, the, the kind of cult of the wine critic, that was a huge part of it as well. I was there when, um, for quite a few years, when Greg Trott was still alive, who was the founder of Wurra, 
and just such a fabulous bloke to to be around um, and to work with. And Greg employed Tim James as the CEO, general manager. And again, like Ian Reds, Tim's been a fantastic mentor for me, both in terms of a winemaker and as a wine show judge as well. So Tim really encouraged me to get into wine show judging, which has been a huge part of my career as well. And then you found your way back to the Hunter. Yeah, so that was in 2009. So an opportunity came up to take over as general manager and winemaker at Tower Estate. So um, Lynn Evans had passed away, obviously, by that stage, but um, it was just too good an opportunity to take, to, to walk past, really. And, I mean, I've never been a person to kind of stay in one place too long. Um and have had no problems sort of moving around the place. So, yeah, sort of up stumps and, and move back to the Hunter for, and I was there for six years in total. And at what point did you conceive Stargazer and how did you decide that that was going to be a, a Tasmanian venture? I guess, like, I'd fallen in love with Tasmania even when I was still at Wirra. Like, I'd come down here for sales trips and... You know, even then it was the, the similarities between New Zealand and Tasmania was something that really imprinted themselves on me. When I was at Tower, we were sourcing because Tower's whole philosophy was the best fruit from the best regions. So we were we made a Kunawara Cabernet, Clear Valley Riesling, Barossa Shiraz, Hunter Shiraz, Hunter Semyon, et cetera. But we also added a Tasmanian Pinot to the portfolio. So I'd come down here as... Uh, over the years and and source fruit from down here for Tower. Then I actually got made redundant from Tower Estate at the end of 2011, I think. So I ended up coming down to Tassie in 2012 and doing vintage at Bay of Fires with Peter Dredge and sourced a tiny amount of Huon Valley Pinot and that was the start of Stargazer. So it was kind of born out of adversity in some respects. And it just kind of grew from there. So I was still based in the Hunter. Um, I was I got a job subsequently working for the Australian Wine Research Institute, uh, managing an industry sort of outreach project based in the Hunter. But they allowed me to keep doing Stargazer on the side. So it just kind of grew from there. I remember when we were talking recently, you were telling me that you really started out with with very little in the way of capital to get Stargazer <laughs> underway. <laughs> yeah, I think little in the way of capital would translate to nothing. Um, <laughs> so I'm very proud of the fact that my first great payment I paid were on my credit card. Uh, and as I tell people, it wasn't to get the frequent flyer points. So there certainly wasn't a whole huge mass of capital banked up behind the Stargazer project, that's for sure. It's all been done very hand-to-mouth, but having a full-time job and doing it on the side initially and then after that consulting as well, so that's kind of bankrolled the whole, the whole scheme. And that's enabled you to invest in, in some of your own vineyards there as well? Yeah, so in 2016, I made the big move and purchased a an 11 hectare block in the Coal River Valley. One hectare of which was planted to had an existing vineyard on it. Uh, and in 2017, so that's when I moved down here permanently. Uh, and in 2017, planted another two hectares, which I got the first fruit from uh, this vintage which was pretty exciting. Uh, and then this year we're, I'm planting another two hectares as well. So, yeah, so that will take me up to five hectares, which the intention is, is that that will enable me to be a state, 100% state grown down the line. When you were coming to look at actually buying vineyards, um, were you, you know, were you definite about Coal River Valley was where you wanted to be or were you open to being in any of the other, you know, sub-regions in Tassie? I knew that I wanted to be in the south just because, you know, from a weather pattern, I was a bit nervous about the north, I suppose, to a certain extent, and I wanted the, the coolness of the south. So that meant that it was kind of Coal River, Derwent or the Huon. Stargazer is focused primarily on Pinot, Chardonnay and Riesling, so that kind of ruled out the Huon because although I love their Pinot, I think, you know, their, 
Chardonnay is right on the edge in terms of ripeness and it's certainly not Riesling territory through there, just way too marginal. So then it was the Derwent and the Coal River. And the Derwent Valley, there was really only really large blocks of land available, like 40 hectares, 50 hectares, so which was just too much for me to manage by myself. So this block in the Coal River Valley came and the Tea Tree region of the Coal River Valley came on the market. So pretty much it was kind of a process of elimination, I guess, James, as much as anything. So, yeah, that's how it worked out. And, you know, the Coal River can do all three varieties to an exceptional level. So happy days. Now, you've got some fairly unusual blends in your lineup, one of which is the Rada, which I was lucky to try a couple of years ago. We don't really see Pinot Meunier around at all much in Australia. So how do you get your hands on that fruit and how is that blend conceived? Yeah, so I wanted to do something. I guess I was kind of forward thinking, knowing that I had these young vines with that would be bearing fruit at some point um, from my vineyard and knowing that that Pinot probably wasn't going to go straight into my single vineyard Pinot, so I'd needed to have a home for it. And also I really wanted to make a wine that was an early release style, fruit forward, not intended to be overly complex, but just, you know, delicious. I drink a fair amount of Beaujolais and those kind of styles. So, you know, I just wanted to do something. And I'm actually putting some Gamay in this year at my place. So the writer may morph into being a Gamay Pinot blend, we'll see. Meunier obviously has a home in Tasmania from a sparkling perspective. There's not much um, table wine made for it. So I managed to source some Meunier from Piper's Brook Vineyard up in the north um, a few years back and and it's co-fermented with Pinot and it's done really well. Like There's definitely been a swing towards those lighter-bodied wines and the beauty of the Rada and other styles like that is that in, you know, warmer areas, you know, like Queensland or whatever, you can chuck it in the fridge and have it slightly chilled. It's gone down really well. And the Tupelo is um, Gris, Riesling and Gewürz. How did that one come about? Being a Kiwi, I love Gewürz and some of the most highly regarded wines in New Zealand are with the most history really are Gewürz, you know, from the Lawson Dry Hills Gewürz, Dry River Gewürz, Tafari Ra, you know, they're all really well regarded and I love those heady aromas that Turkish delight and the rose petal and orange blossom, you know. Um, But I knew that in terms of selling it as a straight varietal, that's pretty much the definition of pushing um, the proverbial uphill. So the whole idea with the blend is to kind of smuggle it into people in kind of a disguised format. Um, And it's taken a while actually for that wine to kind of gain some traction um, and we sort of have finally figured out that if I if it's put on a wine list as a Pinot Gris blend, then it flies. Um, you just can't name the Riesling or Gewürz, which is pretty funny. But then, you know, um, last year I was really lucky that the 2019 version uh, was named in the Holiday Wine Awards as the best other uh, white blend. So now it flies off and, of course, I can't make enough. So... Um, careful what you wish for, I suppose. But yeah, it's a, and obviously it's, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Alsatian wines as well. And it's kind of a homage to Jean T type blends from Alsace, which are Pinot Gris Riesling Gewürz with some Pinot Blanc as well. And you said, you know, that you thought your 2019 Pinot was, was the best that you'd made um, from that site. So obviously the, the vine age is having a role there? Yeah, and I think, I mean, 2019 was just a beautiful vintage down here, just some stellar wines made. So, I mean, it's like anything, you can kind of, it's the right time, right place, all that kind of thing, right site. Um, but that's, as yeah, as you said, that's probably the, the wine that I'm most happy with in terms of Pinot. Well, closest, I guess, to what I actually want, want to achieve with Pinot thus far. So since 2016, it's all been a state fruit from the 
the original vineyard, which was planted in 2004. So some older Pinot clones, no, no, not terribly sexy, you know, Burgundian clones. Um, but if the crop level was kept under control, which it, it was in 2019, um, then it can produce some really stellar fruit. So, yeah, very happy with that. And, and excited, obviously, with the newer clones that I've got in the new section, how they'll perform over the next few years. Tell me about the Chardonnay, because you, you sound pretty excited about how your Chardonnay plantings are looking. I got a little bit of fruit from the new stuff this year. We got um, two, I think it was just over two and a half tonne from the new Chardonnay section. But, I mean, this year I think is going to be an incredibly strong Chardonnay vintage in Tasmania, just some beautiful-looking fruit on the vine and then subsequently in the winery as well. But just the flavour from these young vines, and I've got four different clones there, but just the flavour from those vines was just amazing on the vine. Um, So pretty excited about the future for that little patch of Chardonnay, I think. Um, And, you know, I mean, there's some fantastic Chardonnay that's already coming out of the Coal River Valley, so I think I'm in good company. What about Riesling? Because Riesling probably is... Tassie Riesling maybe is in the shadows of Pinot and Chardonnay a little bit. What do you think Tassie does with Riesling that um, stylistically, how does it, you know, how does it contrast to to maybe the uh, South Australian Rieslings that people might be more familiar with? Yeah, it's interesting because I think Riesling is very much the underdog down here and overshadowed by, you know, sparkling wine, which is obviously a huge part of what Tasmania does, but then Pinot and Chardonnay as well. So, you know, Riesling's only 8% of the total plantings in Tasmania, um, but I think we really have a um, a real spot in terms of the spectrum of Australian wine styles with regards to Riesling. I mean, you know, the Clear Valley obviously produces those beautiful linear, almost rapier acidity-like wines, particularly as young, young, young wines. But Tasmanian, and certainly in the Coal River Valley, it's quite a different style as young wines. The acidity is a different structure. We get really low pHs, but our TAs aren't off the charts high. So, um, And one of the striking features about the Coal River Valley, and I think this has a big impact on the Riesling styles, is that our soils are really high in calcium. Um, and that calcium promotes incredible skin thickness. So when you're tasting the fruit and eating the fruit, leading up to harvest, that chewiness of the skins, but also the flavour that's in the skins, all those beautiful terpenes which are in the skins, is really a striking feature of the Coal River Valley. Um, So I've been doing more and more more skin contact over the last few years and um, even fermenting on skins to extract that that flavour. But those positive phenolics as well, which really gives the wine some structure um, and some texture and richness. So, so yeah, Tasmanian Riesling's quite different from their Clear Valley or Eden Valley counterparts, probably more akin to um, Great Southern Rieslings from WA um, in terms of that zesty, zesty acidity. I make two Rieslings and one of them's off dry. It's got a little bit of sugar. So that kind of makes that acidity a little bit more, and you barely notice it because the pH is so low. But that sort of acts as a bridge between the acidity and and then that phenolic texture as well. So, yeah, quite a different beast down here. You've got a pretty interesting packaging, pretty unique artwork. You must be working with a particular artist to to come up with that. Well, I'm I'm really lucky in that um, right from the get-go with Stargazer, I've been working with Mel Terrett who is a graphic designer based in South Australia um, and she has been associated with some other fantastic wine labels. So the SC Panel labels, um, Kerry Thompson's labels as well, Wines by KT. And working with her has just been a joy because she's an artist in her own right, but she has the same mindset as me of being anti, you know, boring white labels, I suppose. Um, I had a very clear intention right from the outset that I wanted the labels to reflect the beauty of Tasmania. So the Pinot, Chardonnay and 
Riesling use old postcards from the Historic Places Trust of Tasmania, which feature local landmarks like Eagle Hawk Neck and the Shot Tower, um, Cape Raoul on the Chardonnay label. And then the Tupelo and the Rada are actually artworks that I commissioned from Kate Perkutowski, who's a, well, she's based in Brisbane now, but she's Tasmanian originally. And I saw her work in an art gallery in Launceston and was just um, completely struck by it and um, knew that they'd make fantastic labels. So Kate very generously agreed to work with me. Um, and provide some artworks for those labels. And I've still got one tucked up my sleeve, which could potentially be for the Pinot Blanc. Um, so, yeah, so and it's it's great now to have that, like people remark on the labels and to have that strong association, I guess, with both a sense of place but with something that's beautiful as well. That was always really important. Going back to something that we touched on very early in the conversation, was there a moment where it dawned upon you that you were going out of the frying pan and into the fire in terms of male-dominated industries? It's like anything, when you're sort of starting out, you're, not, you're so immersed in the work that you're doing that you don't really know or recognise the environment in which you're doing it so much. Um, but certainly, you know, at Wirra and, you know, we had growers there that, would refuse to deal with me because I was female, which was quite confronting. And quite a few other, you know, just objectification in terms of being told to smile at awards ceremonies and, you know, um, I mean, I could go on and on. But I guess in terms of the penny starting to drop, it was really discovering that women only made up 10% of winemakers and less, like 9% of viticulturists in the Australian wine industry. And just despite being half of the graduates coming through at Adelaide, you know, Uni of Adelaide and, and CSU and just being completely horrified at those statistics. Unfortunately, I can't even tell you if that's changed because we don't have the statistics of what the current makeup is of men and women in our industry, which I think is horrifying that our industry doesn't even care that much to be able to survey its constituents. Um, so I was involved with the Australian Women and Wine Awards for a number of years in terms of raising the profile of women in the industry, and I think that's done an incredible job. But there's still a lot of heavy lifting that needs to be done. And it's not just about women in the industry. It's about diversity in the industry and making sure that there's a range of different voices that are listened to and incorporated and included and the richness that that can bring and the results that it can bring to the industry as well. We know that better decisions are made when there's a diverse range of people around the table. So I think that's incredibly important. Were there any moments where it nearly turned you off staying in the industry? Look, I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't say that there's been numerous times where I wanted to hit my head against a wall. And I have to say, <laughs> Stargaze, you know, starting Stargazer was a response to that because I knew that in terms of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to create, that would have to come under my own steam um, and that the career opportunities for me at that point as a female were limited. You know, I'd been made redundant from the job that I was working at and was a, had applied for other jobs, and they'd all gone to blokes. So, you know, in terms of being able to dictate my own path and not have to tolerate any of the um, behaviour that I had tolerated in previous roles, um, that's just kind of made sense. And, you know, I think I'm sure I'm not alone in that regard when you look at the number of strong, intelligent, smart, talented female winemakers, which, and I hate that term, um, who have started their own brands. There's a reason for that. You mentioned earlier on that, you know, you don't like staying the, the one place for too long, but it sounds like <laughs> you've, you've certainly put down roots in Tassie. Yeah, I think now, I mean, it's taken me to the, you know, I turned 50 this year, so it's taken long enough, but I'm done with the, the interstate travel now, I mean, moving from the Hunter down here was um, a huge exercise. So, yeah, I'm done. 
this is this is the spot for me for sure. Particularly now that direct flights have opened between Hobart and New Zealand, even if it is just Auckland, not the South Island, it's a perfect combination of Australia and New Zealand. The other things that's so great about being down here is just, as you know, there's just so many dynamic projects happening, not just in the wine industry, but across cider or um, spirits or gin and beer. And, you know, it's there's so many amazing, creative, talented, smart people down here doing some extraordinary things. And the cross-pollination that is happening and will happen, happen over the next few years is going to be really exciting. Um, I sit on the board of Wine Tasmania and it's, um, yeah, there's some cool stuff happening at the moment and it's an exciting industry to be a part of, an exciting place to be as well. Are there plans to have a cellar door at some point in the future? Yeah, so I'm just kind of in initial discussions um, with some architects at the moment in regard to that. So, um We've got to get a vineyard shed, a decent vineyard shed built first. Uh, so hopefully a few years down the line, just a very small cellar door. It won't be um, enormous by any stretch and it'll probably just be appointment only. Barely a day goes by and I don't get a phone call or an email from people asking if I've got a cellar door. So it will be great to be able to have somewhere to, for, to, you know, for the Stargazer brand to have a home, I suppose. Where can you where can people find your wines otherwise? Is it is it mainly direct uh, from the Stargazer website? Yeah, so online, um, and I've also got a pretty complete list of stockists on the website because I've had some you know amazing support right from the get go from incredible restaurants and retailers throughout Australia. So that's all on the website as well. And the twenty twenty uh, Chardonnay and Pinot can't be too far off. Yeah, so they'll be released in September, as will the current vintage 21 Riesling and Tupelo and the 21 Rad will be released sort of around November, I imagine, at this stage. Exciting. Well, Sam, thanks so much for your time. No problem at all, James. Pleasure. Great to catch up. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.